Welcome to your College Bound Kid. A podcast for parents and families everywhere. Whether you have kids that plan to attend college or you have current college students, you want them in and you want them to graduate. And you want a quality education that improves your ability to be a strategic, critical thinker. I am Mark Stucker, and I'm a college coach. And I am Anika Madden, and I am a parent. It is Thursday, June 6th, and welcome to episode number 71, 13 Things to Consider Doing If Waitlisted. In this week's news, colleges have been under pressure to admit needier kids. It's backfiring, and we're in chapter 71 of 171 Answers, and Mark is sharing 13 things that your child can do if they are waitlisted. And this week's question segment continues as Mark outlines the case against the new environmental context dashboard, also known as the ECD. And this week, Mark interviews our very first college professor, Dr. Josie Urbastondo, also known as Dr. Josie. She's an English professor at the University of Miami and the founder of Write Your Acceptance. And this is Preparation for the Personal Statement, Part 1. Anika, I was too embarrassed to admit this last week, but do you know that I just sleep at the Minneapolis airport? <laughs> no, why? Ooh. Because I did a bonehead move. Uh-huh. I confused the time of my arrival with the time of my departure. So I show, <laughs> so, so I show up at the gate Southwest, like for my six o'clock, really early, like two forty-five. Mm. This is Sunday. You know, and I'm like, all right. And they was like, do you know your flight left at two thirty? No. And then they said, um, it's Memorial Weekend. There's no more flights until six thirty five a.m. So, sure. so, I slept, so I slept at the airport. So I have a little cold, and so my voice is a little off. Whoopsie. <laughs> so, I'm sure it's been done what? before. I'm sure. <laughs> By me, it's my second time doing it. Oh my God. Well, the last time was 20 years ago. Uh, okay, we'll take <laughs> the you. recruitment trip. You get your 20 okay. year pass. Okay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but you know what? We have such awesome listeners, and special thanks to all of you who tipped us off that we had some technical pop- problems with our last episode. Um, if you couldn't get episode to seven, 70 to work, one of our listeners found out how you get it to work. Just you have to delete the episode and then re upload it, and it should work because we tried this with least a I don't know a bunch of people and everybody that did that got it to work so sorry Mm -hmm. about the inconvenience it caused uh, but the thank you listeners because if you didn't tell us it didn't work we wouldn't know (laughs) (laughs) just stay on recording keeping on rolling but now just for clarity's sake Mark when you say delete you mean not if you subscribe to the to the episode and you have it like uploaded into your subscription and then delete it out of there right 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 right. yeah if you're just playing it now for the first time you're not a subscriber it should work but if you or subscribe, then you got the old version, then that should work for you. Kill that should work. And before we transition, I just have to say this. If you have a high school graduate who is college bound, make sure they are checking their email and mm-hmm. their snail mail and their portal, because now is the time colleges are sending out very important communication about things like housing, orientation, healthcare, course registration. And it's also a great time to set up a payment plan if you need that. So just mm-hmm. want to put that out there in the universe. <laughs> mm, don't forget the spam. Check the spam, please. Check the spam. Check the spam. And for those of you who are interested in demonstrated interest, I am doing a one-hour webinar on June 11th. If you're interested in that, just go to revolutionprep.com back forward slash webinars <laughs> and you can sign up. Got to get that forward slash in there. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Anika, time for your favorite part of the podcast, countdown time. Yes, let's go. So we are doing the nine jobs that are growing the fastest, but also pay at least $75,000. Number nine, operations research analyst. Number eight, information security analyst. Tied for number eight, physical therapist. And this week, number six, genetic counselor. Wait, number seven. Genetic counselor. Well, two are tied for eight. When two oh, are tied for eight, okay. then you, yeah, then you skip seven, you know? Error, okay, so, gotcha. Yeah. yeah, so number six, genetic counselor. What do genetic counselors do? Genetic counselors assess individual or family risk for a variety of inherited conditions, hmm. such as genetic disorders and birth defects. They provide information and support to other healthcare providers or individuals and families who are concerned with the risk of inherited conditions. They work in university medical centers, private and public hospitals, diagnostic laboratories, and physician offices. 
They work with families, patients, and other medical professionals. How do you become a genetic counselor? You typically need a master's degree in genetic counseling or genetics, and you also need board certification. And hmm. the median pay is $80,370 as of May 2018. Job employment, they are projected to grow 29%. Oh, my goodness. Wow. Over four times the national average between 2016 and 2026 due to hmm. ongoing technological innovations, including improvements in lab tests and developments in genomics which is the study of the whole genome, are giving counselors an opportunity to conduct more analysis. What say you, Miss Anika Madden, about this field? <laughs> I say it sounds this pretty time good. I'm gonna, this time I'm going to do an interception ahead of time. I'm going to throw it out of bowl. I do not want to hear about you, John or Janaea. This is the, the okay. career for them. Okay. Well, I have nothing to say. <laughs> <laughs> that was all you were going to say. <laughs> no, it does sound pretty darn interesting. Seriously. And, but yeah. why can't I? But wait, why can't I add this to the John list? What's wrong with me adding it to the John yeah, list? Yeah. As I long mean, as he wants to do it. As long as right. he wants to do it. It's, it's, this okay, is the consideration right? list. You remember? There we go. Now, there remember, we go. I'm That's off Janae now. I'm leaving Janae alone. That's when you okay. should be alarmed. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> but it's it does sound good. awesome, though. I'm excited. I know. Awesome. Y'all check stuff. it out. Let's turn to college hot topics in the news. All right, Mark, this week's article, it is entitled Colleges Have Been Under Pressure to Admit Needier Kids, and it's Backfiring. And this is found in the Washington Post. It's written by Miss Catherine Rampell on the earlier part of this year. And so this article is about these two university professors, one from Stanford, one from University of Virginia, um, who determined that the incentives and the ways that these schools are um, encouraged to admit low-income students has come with a cause to many other students. And one of the first examples that she gives is that, <clears throat> excuse me, the schools that have increased numbers around Pell eligible students um, is great. However, they are largely now neglecting, excuse me, neglecting those low-income families who make just a little too much to qualify for a Pell grant, yet they are still in substantial need of funding. Makes sense. And so another highlight is what she calls the economic opportunity measure, um, which is what they're claiming that is causing a distortion of enrolling large, large numbers of poor kids. And even though they've got the poor kids covered, now the school is and the school is being rewarded for enrolling these poor, poor kids. So, Mark, all in all, it sounds like to me that they are wishing for this one perfect way to capture a wide range of low income students. So, Ms. Rampail, she goes on to share the, uh, pr the proposal by these two professors. And what they're saying is that the colleges should look at their pool of students based on its academic mission and location. And then they need to take that that pool and determine what the income distribution will be across their campus. So Mark, why don't you please go ahead and spell that out for us and tell us if that is admissions utopia or what or not. Oh, like, I like your setup. That was good. Um, I'm going to provide just a little bit more background going back stuff beyond this article. So um, Car Carolyn Hoxby and Sarah Turner, the two professors you've mentioned, uh, they have some credibility. Uh, because they have, they are economists, and they've been actually studying income inequality for some time on college campuses. In fact, Hoxby is really well known for a 2012 very influential paper uh, that she wrote on undermatching. Remember how we talked about undermatching mm -hmm, about a month mm -hmm, ago? Mm -hmm. And with the three A, it ends up going to a college for like students with two eight, basically. Right. But it's simple. and so that created all kinds of commotion within the educational world, and it's spawned a whole bunch of other studies and a bunch of other um, sort of economists studying income inequality on, on college campuses. And of course, this is the wealthiest colleges have ever been right now. If you look at elite private schools and public flagship schools, they've never been wealthier, meaning the the average income of the average family is the highest it's ever been in the history of the country. And, hmm. and there are a lot of reasons for that. You know, the cost of college going up, uh, states pulling back their support for higher education, and other reasons as well. And of course, the, the rankings, which tends to cater toward wealthy families. Right. So, so these studies that they, you know, that they generated um, caused all kinds of other studies to, to, to emerge, including a very, very famous one um, called the Equality of Opportunity Project, 
which really captured the public imagination like few scholarly studies have ever done. And so what that has done is it's created this backlash. Now, that study looked at how few students at elite schools are coming from the lowest quintile or the lowest fifth of the population. And it created such backlash that it really forced colleges to have to, to start to change their ways. And one of the things that you saw immediately was you started seeing the rankings start to include uh, whether or not students are enrolling or colleges are enrolling students that are Pell Grant recipients, because it was very, it's very easy to measure Pell that. So like the New York Times ranking, Washington Monthly ranking, a number of rankings, even U.S. News, which forever had always resisted any aspect of social mobility in their rankings, they changed their rankings now to include a social mobility measure in the rankings. Mm -hmm. So you know what happens, Anika, when the rankings change, then colleges start changing, right. right? So then colleges started making it a priority to admit Pell Grant recipients. And, and, and this is like, you know, my first 10 years doing this, Anika, I never heard colleges talk about Pell Grant recipients. But in the last five, seven, eight years, like, you know, you'll see them brag about, here's so many Pell Grant recipients we have, just mm -hmm. like they brag about valedictorians and, and, and other things, right? Right. And, and so that, so it created status with Pell Grant recipients. And so basically what this article is showing is that these same researchers who have shown their passion for the subject mm -hmm. are coming back and saying, you know what, you may have had good intentions, but it's backfiring because... Um, you know, the Pell Grant, what's, what colleges are doing is they're putting all this money into Pell Grant recipients, which, by the way, this is a rough estimate because colleges also look at assets. The formula looks at assets. But basically, it's a family of four making around 45000 roughly. Hmm. You know, depending on your assets, it could be a little different. Um, and depending on how many kids you have in college, it could be different. Mm -hmm. Like, you could even have six, six figures if you have multiple kids in college. But so, But what the colleges did is... That's a, that takes a lot of money if you're going to fund a kid um, at that level, right? So they what they did, and they show the research is that let's say you were in the forty five to let's just say you know seventy five eighty thousand dollar range, mm -hmm. like that the funds for you drastically cut off because they got shifted toward the Pell Grant recipient. So they said so that's what they're saying is they're saying that's not right. And while it's true you help maybe the poorest of the poor more. There's another group that still can't afford your schools and you're also gapping them and not giving them money. Mm -hmm. And so that's really what they're speaking out against. And um, my concern is a couple of things. I think their proposal, while I think it is utopic to answer your question, Anika. Okay. That was your question. I think it's utopic because what they're arguing is, are you looking at the income distribution of your state and are you moving, are you allocating more money to people that are on the lower ends in your state. Because what they argue is that wealthy states like Wisconsin and Connecticut, they don't have very many Pell Grant recipients. So they don't, so they don't look good in these new metrics. But that doesn't mean that they're not still helping the poorest members within their state. Right. So that's one of the things that they argue. But the other problem with the proposal is that only really works for public schools and not really for private schools. Mm. So, so, you know, so I think that I think it's I think the research that they've done is really good. I think it's important research because it's clear like they present an extremely compelling case when you look at it that funds for people that just fall outside that Pell Grant level have been significantly reduced right. uh, because, of course, colleges want to look good. And if this is a new thing that's going to have some status to it, then they're going to jump in that direction. Right. Yep. Um, so I think they do do a good job on that. The one thing I would give a little bit of pushback on, though is I don't think it's fair to call Pell Grant recipients just the poor mm -hmm. because the me the median income in this country for a household is 59,000. Mm -hmm. And so 40% of people in the country qualify for Pell. So, you know, I know on, on these college campuses, it's very poor. Right. I mean, if you make like 50,000 and the median income is 150, you know, then yeah, you're really poor within that context. Right. But nationally... I think it's better when you're talking about Pell Grant recipients to refer to to it as low and moderate income, because when you look within the national spectrum, 
some of their incomes are just slightly under average. And that mm-hmm. may seem like a technicality, mm-hmm. but I still think it's an important point because it's still 40% of the population is still a pretty big chunk is what I'm trying to say. Right, right. What do you think? Well, I think it's interesting because I was feeling some kind of way about that title she was given about needier kids. And I mean, that word needier to me is just sounds a little condescending in itself, but I think the, I think the better, more especially when we're talking about these populations to your point about them just being on the cusp of something. It's not that they're just like dying in the ditches that there is a disadvantage. I think that's the, that's my going term that I, that I prefer to hear when we talk about these groups, um, that they're, they're disadvantaged. They're in, they're financially disadvantaged. Call them what they are. You know, that the, the needy are, I'm just like, come on girls, come on, better term, but yeah. That's- well, you know what? I, I completely agree with you. Uh, but I do want to give her credit because, you know, her article, she does indicate that there's no question that, there's a tremendous wealth disparity on college campuses oh, sure. and something needs and something needs to be done about it. Like here, are a couple of quotes, she says, pressure has been building on colleges to stop chasing the same small subset of privileged, highly test prepped applicants and start admitting needier kids. And then she also says for decades, U.S. News and World Report has distorted schools decisions about which students are, should be admitted by allocating their scarce dollars often throwing them at richer kids with higher test scores. So I think she shares the same passion Mm -hmm. um, that the writers have. And I really commend her for that. But you know what? I was thinking a lot about this, uh, Anika. The title is really, really inflammatory. Mm -hmm. But uh, the part that I find inflammatory is not the word needier, but to say it's Mm backfire. That to me was really strong. Um, You know, at the same time, Inside Higher End read a similar article And their title, you know, of their article, I thought was a lot more balanced. I don't have to pause to find it. (laughs) I had it right here. Okay. Uh, Their title, it says, their title was Underrepresented Students' Unintended Consequences. Hmm. And and I thought that was a much, really more accurate title. But then I asked myself... Like, would we have clicked the article like it did capture our attention, that title, right? Which is kind of what they do in writing these days. Like, you have to, like, suck someone in with a with the second title to get you to read it. <laughs> True, <laughs> so but they, stale. So <laughs> we took the bait. We took the bait. <laughs> okay, click bait. Turn it. Yeah, it's all good. But uh, it's a great article. So, so, so great what should our listeners, what should our listeners <laughs> take away from this? Okay, huh, what do you think? I wonder. I don't know. For those uh, economically disadvantaged youth that are on that cusp of, you know, just making not just a little bit too much. You know, that's always the group I'm more, you know, that I'm most concerned about too, because that is to me unfair. Um, those students who need a lot, but they're just acknowledged like, oh, you're gonna be fine. Um, I don't know. What is the what is the takeaway? I'm just frustrated. My takeaway is frustration. <laughs> we don't want well, that to be it yeah. for everybody else. <laughs> Uh, No, I mean, I think one of the takeaways is I don't want people to be shocked by the cost of college. And I want you to know really early on how much colleges are going to cost you and that you have a game plan and you plan for it. Uh, Because I see that all the time where people are blindsided by the cost of college. And when you know, you can put a plan in place. Yep. So let's make it that. There it is. Now it's time for our step by step walkthrough of the college admissions process. Okay, friends, we are in the 71st chapter of a book I wrote called 171 Answers to the Most Asked College Admissions Questions, where we go chapter by chapter through each book and hit on a couple of the points. And the name of the chapter in this book is What Are 13 Steps to Take If I'm Waitlisted? So we're not going to go through all 13, but we'll highlight, you know, the four or five that jumped out off the page for us. Anika, what were what were your top ones that grabbed you? And then I'll share a couple of the ones that I think are most important uh, to me. Well, the first one that stood out to me is one that you taught me so many years ago. And that is about checking out the waitlist statistics at the school on the common data set. You know, I love that common data set. Mm-hmm. So that's huge. Mm-hmm. And that's, a, that's a, a great reminder for me. And then the next one um, is what. Hold on one oh. second, Anika, because I love okay. that one. Well, explain why why it's so important to check out because those statistics. Because if you look and you see that the school is accepting 2% of their wait list, then you should just mosey on about your business. But if you see that they, yep, yeah, if you see that there's a chance, then, you know, just know the data. Just look at the data and see what's, what, what is happening in real time. That's, you know, that's the reality around there all of that. Um, so you want my next one? 
Okay, mm-hmm. so the yeah. next one is the obsession. Like, don't obsess over the schools where you've been waitlisted. And I think that's a big deal because I know uh, how, you know, how kids, you know, these kids just get, you know, obsessed. <laughs> oh, I can't think of another word right now. Um, and the other part is, for me, was how to remain or remove yourself from a wait list because you sometimes, or at least I used to think, I mean, you speak to it for everybody else. I just thought a wait list was mm-hmm. a wait list and you just, it was just sitting out there, but you can actually formally remove yourself or you can ask to stay on the list. Like they'll ask you if you want to stay on or not. And there's a kind of a scientific way you can go about, you know, writing the letter to the person saying almost like a, 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 a what is it? A follow up to your interview and cover letter <laughs> on a job saying, Hey, no, 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 no. no let, me, let, let me elaborate. So, so cause it's a very important okay. point. Some people think, people think that, uh, if you get a waitlist letter that you're automatically on the waitlist. No, right. you have to request to be yeah. on the la- waitlist. And now, and nowadays, almost every school has moved away from snail mail and this kind of thing. And now it's almost always some online portal, you know, that you go in and you indicate, you know, it's, it's almost always done online mm-hmm. now. And so the clear, clear instructions will be indicated if you want to stay on the waitlist. And that's important for the school too, because they, they need to know who's serious about them as right. well, right? So, uh, and for most, it varies, but generally about half the people do and half the people don't. It depends a little bit on the prestige and status of the school. Sometimes for less selective schools, it might be like one third. Uh, and then unless the college knows, okay, these one third of these students, these are the ones that are real serious. Mm-hmm. And remember, wait lists are like the school's insurance policy if they don't get the yield that they want. Yep. Right? That's what it's yep. for. Um, what uh, else? Those are my biggies. You got some other biggies? A couple. You hit most okay. of mine. Uh, something to know, 39% of schools um, actually have wait lists. So actually, the majority of schools don't have wait lists. So it's not something that every school is going to have. You'll tend to find it with more highly selective uh, schools. Um, there is a difference between a courtesy wait list and a genuine wait list. Mm. And um, what do you think a courtesy wait list is? Um, I think courtesy is more and from what I remember from reading. I think it was the one where uh, it's more like a soft rejection. <laughs> Correct. It's like, ah, Correct. we don't want <laughs> you to feel so bad, but you're not coming. Uh, it's exactly okay. what it is. It's a soft rejection. So when would be times when schools would do courtesy wait lists? Um, I don't know. I can't remember that. So you know, and I'll speak from my own admissions experience because we would do these, you know, soft rejections. Sometimes there's there's one of two things that happens with with a well, first of all, let me say this. The public, meaning students, they take waitlist information much better than they take denials. Mm-hmm. Like I can't tell you how many times students will say, at least I was waitlisted, <laughs> you know, especially if it's a highly selective school they knew was really right. hard to get in. You know, and so so it's a much easier letdown. And so the colleges know that. Boarding school admissions, we knew that as well. And sometimes you have people for whom one of two things will happen if you just deny them. There'll be so much political backlash to your office that you're not going to want to have to deal with it. Um, or it will create such brouhaha and such an upheaval either in the life of the school or the family that it's just not, you just don't want to put them through it. So examples, uh, just ones that you know I was involved in are things like siblings um, uh-huh. or Siblings are tough. Like one sibling's at the school, you're rejecting another sibling. Twins, highly connected, powerful alumni families. Uh, I remember one time we didn't take someone on board a trustees kid. Who that was rough. Faculty kids that we couldn't take. Those are tough, you know, because these people are so connected to the school. Um, those are all instances, and I could lay in others as well. But and sometimes it just could be something else, even as simple as. You know what? This is a priority. This is a priority feeder school for us, and they passionately believe, working with the counselor there, that we should take this kid. And it's it's going to be, you know, very incendiary if we deny this kid. It's gonna, you know, I mean, probably they're gonna call, they're gonna reach out, they're gonna go above your head, and all that, and all this stuff. You know, people do. People avoid conflict. You know, they avoid conflict. And so those are at times when courtesy waitlists happen. And generally speaking, the question is, how do you find out if it's a courtesy waitlist versus genuine, right? Normally, this is going to be a little bit easier if you're working with your college counselor, if they can reach out and say, listen, let me know, honestly, what are the chances of this student getting off the waitlist? Um, if you can't work through your counselor, you can even have that honest conversation as well and say, can you be honest with me? Like, really, do you think I have a realistic chance or 
you know, and a lot of times they'll kind of steer you a little, little bit in the right direction. They probably they're not gonna come out and say, "No, you got a courtesy weightness. It was really a soft <laughs> denial. We don't want you here." <laughs> Wait, but so Mark, are you saying that to go? What's the difference between you calling and your counselor calling? Uh, the difference is that a lot of times schools will share more candid yeah, information that's just with nature, the counselor. Human nature, share. right? Yeah, because it's just the relationship that you have okay. with the counselor. The counselor sometimes shares things with you. Uh, about applicants and you know that help you make the right decisions Mm -hmm. and you share information with them because you're both trying to get the match right right. and so sometimes confidential information is divulged in a way that they don't say it to the family and they trust that the counselor will be able to present it to the family in a more palatable Mm -hmm. way and so they might go to the counselor and they may say listen i must be honest it's not going to happen then the counselor talks with you and say you may not even know they're thinking that like, let's focus over here you know i've heard the school's not taking many kids this year after what you know they may present it to you in a more palatable way, but that's so, but not everybody has a counselor. Not every person works with a counselor that has that type of relationship mm. with schools. So that's why the, there's not all, that's not always a possibility. Right. You're huge schools with, you know, 800 to one counselor ratios, and they're not really communicating with colleges that way, then you may have to do it yourself. Okay. You know, and so that's that. And then the only other one that I wanted to highlight, because most of the ones that, uh, that you picked were the ones that I was going to pick. Anika. Okay is this is extremely important. It kind of goes along the lines of where you said don't obsess, Mm -hmm. uh, but it's one step further. And that is you need to go ahead and deposit and commit to a school you are admitted at. Because you said you said you turn around. Yeah, you turn around waiting on your waitlist school and you pass May 1. I mean, I I kid you not, Anika, this happened this week to somebody who I'm uh, working with. They tried to go back to a school. Um, after May 1, because they changed their mind late mm-hmm. in the game. It's kind of a long story. And they were like, sorry, you missed the deadline. No. We've moved on. So, so yeah, I mean, this other person still has some options. But anyway, so that those would be my thoughts. Any any final thoughts on uh, waitlist? How about that final point on there where you said, this is what I'm fascinated by. So if you apply for financial aid and are willing to pay in full, have your counsel call and let the school know. Hmm, that wouldn't be me, but... I'm actually really glad you brought that up because you know what, you know, you know, the reason why I'm glad you brought that up is because a lot of times Anika wait lists when schools are waitlisted, they're out of their financial aid. Mm -hmm. So the only people they're going to admit are people who can pay and they're out of financial aid. So now that's very common. And so when they go to see who they're going to admit, it's going to be people who don't need any more money. And so that can be the other thing that's extremely important. We didn't get into this this much. Um, nowadays, we should talk about this because this is important. Schools are using waitlists as part of their admission strategy, meaning that they're waitlisting kids that in the past they would have admitted because mm-hmm. they're trying to keep their admit rates down and they're trying to m- monitor their yields. No. And they're looking for families to say to them, you know, to write basically like a first choice letter in effect saying, if you admit me, we, I will come. Because when, when, when schools go to their wait list, they don't want to go to their wait list and then give you two more weeks to, to decide right. if you're coming. When they go to their wait list, they want to go to people who, well, first of all, if you were waitlisted, it was a true wait list. You met the criteria, right? So you're an, you're, admittable, you're an admissible applicant. You just weren't as strong as the people that they took. Right. And so they're going to go to people that they think are going to come and make a decision. Like you need to be, you need to be prepared to make a decision within 48, sometimes 24 hours. So they do look for that. That's part of submitting that card, right? To show that you're interested. But the people that tend to get off wait lists are in communication. They are saying, listen, I will come to the school if you admit me. Those are the ones that they put the asterisk beside. All right now. And there's one more thing we should say. Wait lists are not like wait lists like in a movie theater, right? Where like you're number two, you're number six or a charter school. That's not how it works. Everybody's put in a demographic bucket. And so when they look back and if they say, oh, you know what? You are our only kid this year from Wyoming and you're not coming. Then they may go to their pool and see who they waitlisted from Wyoming. Hmm. It's not like it's not like you're put in some ordinal list from number one. It's like you're all put in a bucket. And so whatever demographic... (laughs) whatever institutional priority where they're weak and they don't get the yield that they want, that's who they're going to turn to. Mm, Interesting. Whether it's like the French horn player or the lacrosse player or the male student applying as a nursing major when the other male students who applied to nursing are not enrolling and going elsewhere, you know, whatever, you name it. Got it. That's how it works. That's how it works, folks.
Okay. Do you do the question? Or do- oh, I do the question. No. Lord yeah. <laughs> Lord <laughs> mercy. <laughs> Ah, it's, Anika, it's Anika past 9 p.m. Yeah. I know what that yeah. means. You just nailed just like, it. <laughs> no, it's like me at 7 a.m. It's, it's bad. It's not good. It's not good. Okay, let's hurry. It's time for a question from one of our listeners. All right, Mark, we've all heard the major news about the College Board rolling out this initiative as part of the SAT scoring. Um, They're calling it the Environmental Context Dashboard. And we're going to try to call it the ECD, but I'm actually not having a problem saying that, Mark. I know you were like, that's too long. But it's all about um, them providing an additional score um, for students that that they consider to have hardships um, in their environments. So last week we started with the definition and just, you know, just setting the tone or the context around what this dashboard is. So now, Mark, you're going to tell us what the case against it is. Give it to us, Mark. Yeah. And a couple of things I want to say about this. This is really important to frame this conversation. The, the first thing I want to say is, and maybe this just goes back to my whole thinking, but, you know, when it came to both of my kids picking a college, uh, uh, Nika, one thing that was important to me was ideological diversity or political diversity. In other words, I didn't want them to be at a place where they were so one-sided, whether it was the right or the left, that they wouldn't get the best arguments from both sides. Because I don't feel that develops critical thinking. What happens in that environment is that if you're in the minority view, you feel you're going to be criticized or ostracized if you speak up. So you're stifled. And 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 then all that you really get is caricatures of the opposing view. And I don't think it develops critical thinking the most. So with that in mind, the approach I'm taking here is um, I'm going to give you the best arguments uh, against it. Okay. And the next week, I'll give you the best arguments for it. I may not agree with all the arguments for it or against it, but I just think that as a listener, I think you deserve to hear them and you can figure out your own mind whether you agree with them. Um, the other thing that the other thing I want to say is, while it's true that the College Board is calling it the Environmental Context Dashboard, and they oftentimes call, refer to it as the ECD. Don't think that that term adversity score that the media latched onto initially or or adversity index, that's not going away. Um, As I've continued to follow this really closely, that can, you know, it's not like when the, when, when the uh, college board said, no, 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 you got it wrong. It's an ECD. It's environmental context dashboard. Stop calling it a diversity index. The, The media has not listened to that. And I think, I think one reason for that is because within this environmental context dashboard is an actual what they call a disadvantage score, right? There is a disadvantage score. We talked about that last week from 1 to 100, 50 being the median. So just so you know, you may still hear, I mean, I think we deserve, I, I'm going to give the college board the respect of calling it what they want to call it, but the public, you probably are still going to hear the, ter- hear the term adversity score, adversity index a lot. All right. So here are um, some of the strongest arguments against the dashboard. One of them is that it's it's making it sound like all of the disadvantage and the adverse conditions that people encounter have to do with crime, poverty, bad schools, and bad neighborhoods. When in reality, middle income, affluent people encounter many, many other tumultuous challenges in life. Examples, parents could be in a tumultuous marriage. A student could experience physical and emotional abuse or sexual abuse, abandonment. A student could be in a foster home situation in an affluent neighborhood, or mom could be wealthy but addicted to opioids. And some of the pushback is those are significant obstacles that impede um, academic performance, and they are not accounted for because they don't fall into the buckets of bad school bad neighborhood, low-income community, high crime. Um, Any thoughts on that one, Anika? I think that's pretty powerful, actually, Um, because you never, ever think of those students who are going through, you know, I'm a rich kid, but my mom is a drug addict. Like, that's a a big deal. Mm -hmm. All right, so I'll keep moving. And like I said, next week, we'll take the other side. Another, Another one is one that you commented on a little bit last week. And it's it's the the fact that when the college board rolled it out, they said this is going to be a secret score and they're not going to share the number. And, be, and the reason they did, they said they did it is they don't want a kid from a disadvantaged neighborhood to 
know that they got a 97. They thought that would be very, you know, that would that would be discouraging to that student. But the problem is the college board doesn't have a lot of trust and admissions in general right now doesn't have a lot of trust with the American public, right? So a lot of people don't like the whole process of holistic admissions, which they see as very opaque and shrouded in secrecy. You know, they don't like that. They don't really get to know, like, what's the formula? Like, why did this kid get in? And this kid didn't get in. So they're already concerned with the secrecy aspect of this process. And they feel to add one more component of secrecy is not good. And they also feel like, what if there was a mistake in the score? What if somebody wants to challenge the score? There's no process to ever redress it if an error is made. Um, If the student is not seeing the score, um, what if there are inaccuracies? How would they ever be able to be countered? So that's um, another another one of the concerns. Um, Another concern is, okay, you're going to get bonus points because you've lived in you live in this high crime neighborhood or you go to this really under-resourced school, but are they going to look at how long you've lived in that neighborhood? Like, how are you going to stop people from gaming the system? How are you going to stop people from um, abusing the gamesmanship and from manipulation if someone decides to move into a neighborhood like that, or they're just, maybe it's not intentional even, maybe for a short period of time they're in there while they're moving, and so they've been highly resourced almost their whole life, but they've been in a bad neighborhood or a bad school for a short period of time. Um, nothing was rolled out in terms of we're going to look at how long you've been here for X amount of years. So there's a lot of questions around that. Is that really fair? Um, any, any thoughts on the last two, either the opaqueness or the how long you've been in a neighborhood? Kind I think of thing? The how long you've been there is kind of weak to me. Um, mm-hmm. because there's so much effort, concerted effort. And, you know, when they're determining if you're in state, out of state, like they drill down on you in terms of where you've been living and how you're living and all that good stuff. So I don't know about that one, but I mean, there's always going to be one in, the, one in the corner, two in the crowd for anything. I mean, not just this for anything. So I don't know. I feel like that's a little bit too, um, I don't know. I just, I'm not feeling that last argument. Right. Well, you're a good person because you're, you know, bouncing these off you to get your perspective. Another one is, um, how is a kid that that gets a scholarship, let's say, to go to a boarding school? Are they going to be punished because what happens with uh, the with this environment context dashboard is your score gets ranked, right? So they show the average score on the dashboard for your school. So if you're at a school with a lot of really, really wealthy kids, all those average numbers are going to be really, really high. And you're going to be looked as being extremely privileged because you're at this privileged school. So so there's some concern. There's some concern about that. And there's certainly pushback from the schools because part of what those schools have said in the past is. And they've used as a sales pitch. Look at where our kids get in college. Come invest this money in our private school. And now they're hearing that, okay, you're going to make it harder for our kids to get in college because we're going to be labeled as privileged. And that's going to be taken into consideration because, of course, the higher the higher test scores and the higher AP tests and the more APs taken, all of that tends to show up in those more affluent communities. Right. So people feel like they're going to be held to a much higher standard and therefore will be disadvantaged. Well, I don't um, know, though, because there's so many opportunities to if you if someone is that deep into it and they know what's going on ar- going on around how that stuff is being calculated, then that means there's an, a, an opportunity to speak to those in your application. Like, isn't aren't there narrative opportunities to address any of this? And the and my other question, my, I guess, two part. The second part to that is, they're, I mean, they're making it sound as though this is going to be oh, just because I have this score, I'm getting in because of somebody else. This is not like a guarantee that these kids are getting into the schools just because they have these additional scores. I just, I don't know. I feel like they're making. Well, I mean, I know it's a big deal and I know it matters, but I don't know. It just seems like this is going to be just because you have the score, you're in there. We would like to thank every listener who has financially supported our show. We want to make sure that our friends of the show know that you absolutely can make a one-time gift or you can sign up for one of our monthly giving levels. Recently, we received a lovely letter from a college counselor who made a gift and said she wants to support the show quarterly. And that is also okay. 
And if you make a one-time gift or a quarterly gift, you may still be entitled to the same benefits we extend to our monthly donors. That's right. For a gift of $60 or more within the first 12 months, you'll get all the benefits we provide in our sustainer plan. And a gift of $120 or more in the first 12 months, and you'll get all the benefits we offer in our expander plan. So to support the show, all you have to do is go to yourcollegeboundkid.com and click the donate button. Either click the monthly gift tab or the one-time gift tab. And be sure to visit our frequently asked question page, which is also located at yourcollegeboundkid.com for more details. This is also where you can learn about the sustainer plan and the enhancer plan. Your financial support helps us defray the sizable expenses that it takes to deliver all of this great content that is aimed to empower you and your family's college admissions journey. Different people have different abilities to give, but whatever you can contribute will be greatly appreciated and it will allow us to remain commercial free. So thank you in advance. Thank you. So, so you know what, Anika? I'm I'm gonna. This is this is a cliffhanger. I'm gonna pick up exactly on what you said when we get to our fourth part, mm-hmm. okay. because there's a lot of things there that I want to say, but we're not there yet. So I'm gonna stay in my own lane. <laughs> 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 Let me keep it humming. Uh, so, so Heather okay. McDonald, a fellow at Manhattan Institute, is a major critic. She called oh. the College Board's plan a backdoor to racial quotas in college admissions. Um, and so some feel that and are posting it for that reason. She goes on to say the college board's adversity score is going to give a boost for students who are coming from high crime, high poverty schools and neighborhoods. She says being raised by a single parent is going to be seen as a plus factor. Such a scheme is penalizing the Bergios values that make for individual and community success. So this argument is kind of successful people that have worked really hard and done well they now can live in neighborhoods where they're surrounded by people who have worked hard and done well and people in poor communities haven't worked as hard haven't done as well and you're basically um awarding them for their lack of industriousness and their lack of accomplishments Uh and you're penalizing this collection of high achievers that are all gathered in one place Uh so that's her argument what's her now there's a Heather McDonald, you gonna uh, buy her book? Uh-uh. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think so, but I'm just telling you the argument. Just um, because of that. Sorry. When you asked for her name, I started thinking, does she need to like protect herself? <laughs> gonna go after her on Twitter or something? Careful <laughs> you don't normally, what you say you don't, on these you airwaves. Don't normally, you don't normally say what's her name. That's a new that's a new one. <laughs> stop it, Mark. No, we all do right, not put people on it. your college brown kid. We just yes, remember we names. That's all. <laughs> yes, we do. All right. So that's the argument. And I think, like I said, I want to put us on all the arguments and let our readers decide if they agree. So a couple more. And this is interesting because you're getting attacks from the left and the right on this, both sides. Mm-hmm. So so the root, which is on the left. You know, they attacked and said the affluent have already proven the lengths that they will go to game the college admission system. So how does an adversity score provide an objective means to balance the odds? Wrote Jay Connor of The Root. In other words, I think it's a lot about nothing. Um, That's not going to be enough to overcome all the power that powerful privileged people have. So it's don't waste my time. It's like, a, you know, it's like a raindrop in the ocean. That was kind of his argument. Mm. Um Rob Schaefer, who has a long time been a critic of the College Board, and he's the public education director of Fair Test, um, as someone who I'd love to interview at some point on the podcast, uh, and he's the National Center for Fair and Open Testing. You know, this is the group that really tries to get schools to drop the drop the standardized test, right? Mm-hmm. And so he issued a statement and saying that the new index demonstrates what us talking about us. SAT skeptics have we, what, what we've been arguing for years. Basically, he says this. Test makers have long claimed that their products were a common yardstick of comparing applicants from a range of schools. In other words, the test score companies have always said we have a common benchmark that's fair, that's objective. And then he says this latest initiative concedes that the SAT is really a measure of accumulated advantage, which should not be used without an understanding of a student's community and family background. Um, And so basically what he's saying is, you've just proved what I've been saying all along, that you have a flawed test that can't be used the way Mm -hmm. it's been used. That's his argument. 
And then uh, Randolph Argelouis. See what I get for teasing about names? I get the hard names and now I mess mm-hmm. up. Who knows if I got that right? <laughs> He's a branch director of Elite Prep San Francisco. He said the index is effectively the college board admitting that the SAT is unfair. He added, if your score on the standardized test requires a separate algorithm to determine if the score is actually a valid measure of ability, then perhaps it's time to fix the test instead of try to contextualize the score. Mm. So that's an argument. And then good one. some have said the inclusion of the AP opportunity score. So what they've done in this context dashboard, they're also rating your school based on the opportunity to take APs. That's included there. Mm-hmm. And so this argument says the inclusion of the AP opportunity seems like an overt ploy to get more high schools to implement the AP curriculum. We know the College Board has been losing market share to the ACT, so this is a business decision intended to reverse the declining revenue. Any thoughts on any of those, Anika? Uh, I think they're all darn good. <laughs> and, then, <laughs> and then you're going to come back with the case for them, and they're all going to be all darn good. And it's just like, come on, y'all, we got to come. I don't know. I, let's just see how it plays out. Let's just see how it all plays out. I'll read one last one. And so this one basically has to do with the case that you have messed up a lot in the past college board, so you don't get the benefit of the doubt. So Mm. this is, this is, there's a couple of things. The failure of the college board to manage even the nomenclature of this. So that's talking about, you know, the adversity index versus environmental context dashboard, right? Within a day, David Coleman, CEO, was already on TV disputing the concept of the adversity index pledging to release the recipe behind it by noon that day. Then he says it was not released by noon. In fact, having looked at the dashboard, there is an adversity index variable on there. In fact, there are two. One is norm to the state, which seems like a pretty dull knife from which to cut. But control of the narrative has already been ceded to the pundits. Then it it says, this is John Bockenstadt, by the way, uh, one of the real leaders out here, thought leaders and admissions VP of enrollment at DePaul. Finally, as so often is the case, I see the college board as the gang that can't shoot straight. The news burst on the scene with apparently no communication plan, nothing sent to membership, no frequently asked questions, and unbelievably no awareness, no self-awareness of the backlash even. The company that can't roll out a new and genuinely interesting offering without screwing it up as badly as possible, that can't seem to address the test security or test development of the AP registration, or simply send an email out about a school shooting without messing it up has a huge say in who goes to college in America. Oh, wow. Now, Bakkenstadt went on to say positive things about it as well, but that was the part where he blasted. Uh, I can mention his no, positive. Did he thing. after that? Wow. I could mention the positive things <laughs> next week in that section. <laughs> so, anyway, I just wanted people to hear, I, you know, I, I just think we laid, I just want people to hear the case against it and they can decide when they hear the case for it, make up their own mind. That's right. Until next week. There we go. We're trying to bring our listeners back next week. It's our little strategy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, listing family, very excited about our first college professor on your college bound kid. And Dr. Josie Urbastando, who has become a, a friend really to me. Anyone of my students that visits the University of Miami, she tours them around, which has been great. But she gives her background in her education, her time as a professor at the University of Miami. She shares her opinion on her greatest strength, what she believes is the greatest strength of the University of Miami. Then she talks about some of the biggest mistakes students make in their personal statements. Uh, She talks about what she calls the resume roll call essay. She talks about the apology tour essay, which she also calls the I'm sorry, I'm not sorry essay. She talks about the rant and rave diatribe. And she talks about what she means when she says essay real estate. She introduces us to her company, Write Your Acceptance, and she also talks about what is the purpose of the personal statement. And finally, Josie closes by describing what she means by fangirling on yourself. So she's a very entertaining and bright and sharp mind, and I think you're going to really enjoy what she has to say. And now, this week's interview with a special guest. Friends, our interview today is with Dr. Josie Urbastando. Welcome to the Your College Bound Kid, Josie. Thank you so much for having me. So excited. 
Is it okay if I call you Josie? Uh, I know you worked hard to get that doctorate. Oh my gosh, we can lose that. <laughs> Absolutely, please. <laughs> <laughs> so I have to tell our listeners uh, how I how I met Josie. She's actually a listener to our podcast and even shares episodes with some of her clients. And she reached out to me and we just had a really great conversation. That was like in August and sort of kept in touch uh, since then, a little bit of email, text. And so we're excited to have her on today, continuing our focus on essay writing, the personal statement, um, because it's time for juniors to start working on those personal statements. So before we transition, um, Josie, love for you to talk a little bit about your upbringing, your, your educational background, and your experience as a, as a college professor. Sure. So my upbringing was your typical immigrant family. Education was viewed as the vehicle for upward mobility, not just economically, but as a thinking, feeling, uh, just educationally sound individual. And yet my parents didn't attend a four-year college. My mom completed an associate's and my dad um, high school in Spain and before coming to the U.S. to play a professional sport. However, I was gifted my aunt, uh, who received her doctorate in early ed, and so I kind of became her educational guinea pig sometimes. Um, and I grew up with a love of languages and letters, English, Spanish, and kind of a combination of both were always being spoken very, very loudly. Uh, I attended public high school, completed my BA at Florida International University, which is the local public institution in Miami. There, I was gifted yet another intellectual mentor of mine, Dr. James Sutton, who, after I declared I teach high school English because I loved English, encouraged me to attend graduate school. So I then put my big girl boots on, and with the, the <laughs> dreams and anxieties and fears of my entire family, I left home for the first time at 22. So I attended New York University, and it was an incredibly eye-opening experience, not just in scope of the people I would meet and met, but in realizing the immense potential we as individuals don't even know we have. So afterward, I wasn't ready to move back to Miami. I moved to California and taught at City College of San Francisco, which is where I began supplementing my classroom instruction with tutoring positions at the Writing Center. And so I love teaching freshmen and transfer level students as they kind of, it's such an interesting age. They're starting to take ownership of their education and how it will guide them through their life, ideally. And they don't even know it. But uh, fast forward, I returned to Miami in 2007 to begin the PhD program at the University of Miami. And in 2012, I graduated and I was fortunate to be invited to stay on as faculty, which I did. So college professor me and write your acceptance were born then. Nice, nice. So I didn't know about the dad and the professional sports. So you need to <laughs> elaborate on that. Tell us more. So he played uh, what's called Hialai. Uh, in Spain, it's called Sesta Punta, and it's like it was very popular in um, in the U.S. in the '80s, and it was like a betting game. So people would go mm -hmm. and bet on who would win, who would lose, and it was a very kind of well, it still is. I don't know why I'm saying it in past tense, but he no longer plays. But um, but Hialeah still played. It's not as popular, uh, but there are kind of what's called fronton, so where they're played uh, in some in Connecticut, Dania. There's still one here in Miami. And and yeah, so he, he is came there, for is that. Is there anything that it would be close to that those of us who uh, haven't heard of it could relate to? It's kind of like handball, but with okay. uh with like a basket that you kind of latch onto your arm. So instead of wow. grabbing the hand with grabbing the ball with your hand, you are kind of yeah with this basket, and you're kind of yeah hitting the ball against a, a wall basically. It, yeah, and it is it like I most popular it. in Spain? Is it like, what's this country where it's this sort of known for it? So it's pretty popular in the Basque region of Spain, which is where mm -hmm. my, my dad's family is from, mm -hmm. uh, which is kind of the, uh, the Basque region is, the, is separatist. They feel kind of they're part of their own um, nation state, um, at least kind of not politically because they're part of Spain. But there is a section of the Basque region that's, uh, that falls in France as well. So, and they have uh, Euskera, which is their own language, which if you look at the language tree, by the way, it's like all the way far on the right because they can't really tell where it came from. Like there's no kind of root language. Uh, so it's very interesting. But, um, but yeah, so it's, it's pretty popular in, in the Basque region. 
Nice. So let's fast forward to, to you being a college professor at University of Miami since 2012. Uh, talk to us about the courses you teach and maybe your your favorite course or two. So I focus primarily on freshman writing and composition. So the first two courses that every freshman has to take, no matter their discipline, that's where I'm at. And I'll sprinkle in a literature class here and there, but, um, but that's kind of my go-to and what I've been teaching there since I was a PhD student. Um, so over, I don't know, 11 years now. And so my favorite, the, the program, the composition program is great because it gives us kind of very concrete learning outcomes that our students should master because they're really kind of, we're preparing them for the type of academic writing they're going to do in multiple disciplines, ideally. But then we also have incredible freedom to kind of pick and choose themes that, that, we, that are best suited for us intellectually and kind of as a curious individual. And so my kind of freshman two composition course, which is ENG 106 at UM, um, I kind of play around with it a lot. And I will do usually some variation of a Caribbean popular culture and Latino literature um, course. And, um, and so we'll do, we'll look at film, we'll look at music and, and some kind of nonfiction texts and, and really kind of just investigate certain, uh, certain themes and, and issues of the Caribbean tourism and, uh, the cruise industry. And, uh, right now we're talking about notions of nationalism and exile. So kind of moving into the Latino space, which we'll do kind of then music and, We'll look at salsa, whether that was an American product or a Caribbean product. And uh, so it, it kind of reaches its tentacles in a lot of different areas and a lot of different genres and practices. So if, you know, my students like music or movies or uh, what have you, we kind of have something for everyone. So in, in a way, I, I like that freedom because I can teach what I know best and my discipline. But then also I have colleagues who teach about vampires and the history of love and what it means to be cool. So we're kind of all over the place in a fun way. Good, good, good. So, so friends, a lot of people actually contact us about coming on the podcast and Anik and I are very strict about who we bring on. But one thing that really resonated about jo Josie is that how much she really cares about her kids. And she's even offered to have any students that I have looking at U of M uh, to, to walk them around and be a little tour guide for them. So so uh, yes. her, heart, her heart is all in her work. <laughs> in Tell her us work. about that, because I know you think you do tours sometimes, uh, you know, not through the admission office, but, you know. Yes, I do the kind of Josie five cent tour. <laughs> and it's pretty ironic because, yes, I grew up in Miami and now I'm teaching at the University of Miami, but I have no sense of direction. So, so <laughs> many times both. I have to refund. Oh, I have to refund the nickel. <laughs> Because it's like, and to your left, no, no, that's not that building. Mm -mm. You would think I'm not there almost every day of my life. But, but yeah, I love, I mean, it's just such a, an enriching and overwhelming and amazing journey that students and families with parents kind of go on when they're applying and researching and, and finding that right fit for them for college. And just to be a part of that and to, to kind of, I kind of usually stay in my lane with essays, mm -hmm. but to talk to parents and, and kids, students that are interested in UM, just kind of walk them around and talk about the history a little bit of, of the campus and what we do academically and, and uh, socially. It's just a good time. So before we transition to essays, I'm going to ask you a question that I always tell my students to to ask students, which is, what do you see as the greatest strength of UM? And if you were in charge and you could change anything, what would you do to make it better? Ooh, wow. Okay. The biggest strength of UM, I think, is honestly the fact that it's in Miami, that it's located in such a diverse city both racially, economically, there's so many different types of people at the different walks of life and, and negotiating their identity in such various ways that some of the most interesting and productive courses or student engagement events and projects get our students outside of the, of the campus and, and really kind of get to know Miami in not just the kind of Coral Gables campus bubble that we are in uh, for most of kind of the the semester or the academic year. 
So I think the best of of UM is is a city and it's its people and and kind of engaging and having our students who for most of them are just kind of passing by for four years, really get to know the the emotional um, kind of heart and bones of the of the city. Uh, if I had the power to the rule the world, let's see, <laughs> change something. Oh my goodness! <laughs> I know you're happy there. You made that clear I'm to me. I'm drunk with power already. <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> if I could change something, um, if I could change something, and this is, I I'm not sure if this is only you. I'm actually no. I mm-hmm. think this is trending in a lot of universities. Mm-hmm. I would avoid having students declare a major so soon. Mm -hmm. I feel like that's such great pressure. Mm -hmm. And then I hear so much of my freshman freshman students. I mean, Mm -hmm. they're coming in first, second semester. And I already hear in like week 10 when they are looking Mm -hmm. for courses. I already hear the conversations of, oh, I can't take that class because Mm -hmm. it doesn't follow in kind of the trajectory in my required or so they mm-hmm. there are a lot of missed opportunities for courses and experiences that you don't even know may lead you down a different professional path or just nurture an interesting passion of yours. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, so I think that that's a lot of pressure. That makes sense. Let's take a break to learn about Mark's recommended resource for the week. If you're fortunate, like my oldest daughter, Karis, all of the schools you're applying to will use the common application. So you will only have to fill out one application for all the schools you apply to. But even if that's not the case, chances are many of the schools you will be applying to will receive the common application, of which 850 colleges now use. Over 1 million students apply to college through the common app every year. So our recommended resource for episode 71 is the Twitter account for the Common App, which is just simply at Common App. Now, when you follow at Common App on Twitter, you're going to get some great tips on completing your application. Jenny Rickard is the CEO of the Common App, and she's worked in admissions at places like Puget Sound, Bryn Mawr, Swarthmore, and NYU Law. So she's a real pro. She oversees the account and makes sure that it's full of rich and helpful information. For example, on May 22nd, there was a great tweet with a link to colleges that are still accepting applications for seniors. You're also going to be the first to learn about changes to the Common App. Now, here's a great tip for you. They love interacting with their followers, so don't be afraid to send a tweet their way. I also recommend their blog, and you can see a link for their blog by just going to their at Common App Twitter account and you'll see several tweets on May 30th and June 1st with a link to their blog. Finally, I recommend a number of webinars they're having over the summer to announce upcoming changes for the Common App. I know I've registered for these. We will now return to part one of my interview with Dr. Josie Urbastando about the personal statement. So I do have one more UM question, then we'll transition. So yeah. I know in talking with you, you're impressed with the creative writing program at UM. What else can you say either about creative writing or, or English or any strength within the, you know, the department at the school that you can share? Because it is a popular school that a lot of my students look at. Yeah, so UM in general has many strengths and and um, a lot a number of disciplines that are incredibly just sophisticated and and well kind of mapped out. Um, I was in a meeting yesterday, um, and one of the provost office, um, kind of colleagues were discussing about, they were discussing about how geography is doing this kind of, um, crime mapping and, and they're working in conjunction with the Coral Gables police department and how we can kind of help in a more civically engaged fashion, help the police department kind of allocate resources, X, Y, Z. So I feel like there are certain different, so I feel like different disciplines are doing just really, really cool stuff. Um, The English department in particular, and I have to kind of, I I have to give a little bit of a shout out to my people. So um, (laughs) I love the fact we, we have a lot of research coming out of the department, which is great. 
Uh, but I am so, so proud and um, very happy to be a part of, in a very little way, to be a part of kind of the writing that is being not only promoted, but encouraged and published writing that's being encouraged. So two things. Um, Anthurium is a peer-reviewed journal for Caribbean studies, and it is completely free. Anyone in the world can access it. And UM is its kind of basically its mama bear. Mm -hmm. So we have it on our website. And it is because of pioneering work from um, faculty in, in the English department um, in Caribbean studies. And then uh, a smaller but equally noteworthy is a writing contest that we have for our students called Audley, West, Audley Webster Writing Contest. And it's incredible because it really allows our students to not only be acknowledged for the writing that they're doing and the kind of multimodal projects and, and visual rhetoric that they're engaging in, they're thinking of, but it really kind of resonates. It allows students to kind of write a piece and get invested in a thinking process that is sophisticated and, and kind of multi-layered for something beyond the grade. And I think that a lot of students are just looking for that kind of meeting, meaning. And, and so the, the writing contest does that nicely. I think. Nice. So let's transition and start talking about how to get started writing your, your personal statement. But before we do that, how did you get interested in helping students outside of your work as a professor? Because you also, of course, do this outside of your professor work. I do. Yes. So ever since I started teaching at City College in, in California, I've always returned to writing centers. So I've always supplemented my classroom instruction with kind of a tutoring position. I like the one-on-one -on -one work and I love the classroom, the energy, the spirited debate, the gleam in a student's eye when they get a concept or make a connection of their own. Um, and so not so secretly, because my students know this, I think I'm still kind of 20 something <laughs> borrowing phrases I shouldn't be borrowing, but I do, you know, what can I tell you? So I love teaching, but coaching kind of, especially students through the college essays creates kind of the sense of purpose and intimacy that I love. Mm. So I started over 10 years ago, basically as a simple favor to a former student. And then that student told two people. And then um, I had a cousin who was applying to college and it just kind of organically grew. And, and so then I had this aha moment about four years ago now, I formalized uh, write your acceptance as a business. But the work is a privilege. I feel connected to my students kind of as part of their journey in a way that in 16 weeks, I don't feel that with my students on campus. Like I know they care about our conversations, but I know they really want a good grade. You know, <laughs> So it's kind of, um, it's not as kind of intimate, I think. I don't know. It's, it's, um, there's so much kind of emotionally at stake with the with the college application of process with the known factors, right? The pressure of getting accepted, but also there's such power in learning who you are kind of becoming the mighty pen, right? So, um, and, and I didn't go away to study until graduate school. So I have this soft spot for students mm. who don't think they'll belong or that, that it, they're ready or that it's for them. So I want to help as many students I can, yes, apply to college, but also believe in their power to step into kind of unknown spaces and thrive. And I just love that part. That's great. So, so Josie, I find a lot of students start at the wrong place in their college essays. Is that also your experience? And, and if so, what are some of the incorrect mindsets that you find students start out with when they're thinking about their personal essays or personal statements? Totally. Yes. <laughs> so I find like uh, three kind of that every season I kind of come back and stumble upon. Uh, so number one, the resume roll call. So when students want to jam pack the college essay and supplements with a narration of their resume, mm -hmm. and I did this, and then I got an A in that class. Mm -hmm. And then I did this community service. And did you catch that other A? And in so many ways, kind of less is more for the college essay. And we want to share fresh new dimensions kind of to ourselves in our candidacy that isn't always directly captured in the resume necessarily. Um, number two is what I call the apology tour, the sorry, not sorry essay. Uh, I had a terrible nine weeks and got bad grades, which I never do, or my parents' divorce affected my grades and self-esteem, 
or I should have done more community service, but I had this very demanding course. They're all, and, and this is not to kind of poke fun or kind of really um, belittle any of these very, very real and authentic feelings, but I don't feel like it translates mm -hmm. well. Is, is it and that it can come off whiny one, and negative? It comes off, yes, whiny, negative, and, and then there's no kind of growth aspect. So there's no journey there. Um, it tends to just kind of stay in this kind of rut mm -hmm. of, um, I know I did wrong or woe is me. And then it doesn't move on from there. So, oh, so like, that's yeah, good. Yeah. No, no. Did, I like that. Did no, you no. say the third one or not? Yeah, no. Okay. So I kind of started blending them. Okay. So the third one is the rant and rave diatribe, okay. which is that the something unfair happened to me. I've seen like student A didn't get picked for one for a team, although they were like the best at that position or that sport or the teacher didn't like me, but I did well anyway. So it's kind of it stays in that rut of kind of woe is me, but it doesn't move on and show growth and a new mindset or a shift in perspective. That growth is so important. Uh, it's so important. Uh, yeah, yes. it really to, to communicate that. So what do you say to your students when to help them realize they need to change, get out of one of those three, you know, perspectives? Yeah. So, I mean, first and foremost, I feel like, um, the essay prompts, they are asking for totally, I mean, foundational, real formative moments. And maybe that bad grade or not getting picked for a team or the parents' divorce is that moment. And so what I ask them, because I never want to dissuade a student from really kind of who feels compelled to tell a story. Mm -hmm. I never want them to, um, I never want to belittle that, um, that truth. But I do say a few things. So one is that we are a collection of narratives, a collection of, sto of stories, snippets of experiences, memories, how we recall it, how it actually played out. And all that messiness is kind of like our, you know, um, life. And so that's one. And then two, I ask them if the topic or experience is them at their best. Or if it isn't, does it inspire action where they do get to be at their best? So if the second question is a yes, then it's a matter, I think, of what I call a essay real estate. So maybe not getting picked for a team is the first three lines and we say it in like story form and it's not three paragraphs. And so we just start where they think was the entire essay and we just kind of do three lines of that. And then that moves into so much growth and so much reflection and emotional intelligence and kind of showcasing that growth is so much more important than just kind of staying in the kind of moment of explanation. That's great because you can, they can communicate the growth, communicate the reflection, uh, but you don't necessarily just shoot down their ideas and leave them dispirited, you know? So it's taking that perspective right. and using it as a trampoline to, to um, you know, communicate something that has the potential to represent them at their best. And, and having said that, what do you say to your, students who say, what is the goal of the personal statement? Oh my goodness. Yes. That is such an important part of my work. I feel getting students to unlearn what they think the personal statement is. So, I mean, in my opinion, the personal statement is not just a pretty story. It's about showing and doing. So it's part creative writing, part critical thinking. My students in who go with phrases I shouldn't be using my students always tell me it's kind of fangirling on yourself a little bit while flexing kind of critical thinking <laughs> muscle. That is the phrase. So students should be showing how great they are intellectually, but then reveal that journey, that growth, that emotional intelligence, which is key. And so if they move from just telling a pretty story or a heart-wrenching story and they start to kind of break down and reflect, memorialize the symbols and images and, that are kind of working, in their kind of strata of experience, that is where we see that true growth and critical thinking, which I feel is super, super important. Next week in the news, does it really matter where you go to college? And we'll be in chapter 72 of 171 Answers. And Mark shares his advice for undocumented students. And we'll share the case for the new environmental context dashboard next week. And Mark will continue his interview with Dr. Josie in preparation for the personal statement part Anika, have you noticed any difference in my sound at all? Or do I sound the same as normal? You sound good. 
Oh, good. Because remember how we used to say you're a sound snob and you can pick up every little thing? Mm-hmm. This is my first time using this new expensive mic. And this is a new expensive oh, really? mic. Yeah, and the sound booth and everything. And I was waiting for you to notice it, but I was like, oh, did I spend all that money for nothing? <laughs> 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 no, I just talk trash when it sounds bad. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> well, it's good. It's all good. It's like, okay. let's go. <laughs> okay. Awesome. Well, listen, let me talk to you later in the week. All right. We'll catch up. All right. See you later. And that's our show. A big thank you to you, our listeners, for tuning in this week. And if you found this podcast helpful, it would help us tremendously if you would subscribe and write us a review on your favorite podcast listening station. And please be sure to click the share button and send this to someone you know that could really use this information. Your College Bound Kid is produced by John Lockenbaugh. The amazing music that you hear is by Victor Allen Weeks. Artwork is by Andrea Togo. And marketing designs are by Kimberly Blass. If you want to get a copy of the book, 171 Answers to the Most Asked College Admissions Questions, you can go right to 171answers.com. And if you want to have a college coaching session with Mark, you can send him a text to area code 404-664-4340. And if you have a question or a few questions that you would like for us to answer on the show, please email us at questions at yourcollegeboundkid.com. That's questions with an S at yourcollegeboundkid.com. Every week, we'll take one question and include it in the episode. We don't like your questions. We love your questions, so send them our way. And by the way, check out our website, which is just simply yourcollegeboundkid.com. Again, we thank you for tuning in, and we look forward to meeting with you again next week.